Hello, and welcome to the second webinar in the Urban Institute series on strategies for supporting young people transitioning out of foster care. I'm Mike Pergament. I'm a senior fellow at the Urban Institute. Uh, for those who don't know the Urban Institute, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan social policy research organization. And before we start, I want to have a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so this event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterward. Uh, all participants are muted. So if you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A box and you can do that at any time during the interview. Next slide. <clears throat> this series of webinars and the research that underlies the webinars is funded by the Administration for Children and Families Office of Planning, Research and Evaluation or OPRE in collaboration with the Children's Bureau. And it's part of a larger project to plan the next generation of evaluations funded under the John H. Chafee Program for Successful Transition to Adulthood. The Urban Institute leads the project with our partner Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago. And Mark Courtney at the University of Chicago and I are the co-principal investigators of the project. I do wanna acknowledge great support that we received from uh, OPRE, particularly from Maria Wolverton and Kelly McKenzie, as well as from Catherine Keith at the Children's Bureau. Uh, for those who missed our first webinar, which was on the CETA Scholars Program at Western Michigan, uh, that webinar recording and the slides that were used are posted on the Urban Institute website. Today, we're going to focus on the education and training vouchers that are funded as part of the Chafee Act. Uh, ETVs, as they're known, are one way that states can help support youth currently or formerly in foster care to obtain post-secondary education. I'll also mention that we have planned two additional webinars that will happen early next year regarding employment programs. Uh, one webinar will be on formative evaluations that we've done specifically on a couple employer, <coughs> employment programs and then a second webinar more generally on employment programs for youth who have been in foster care. We have not yet uh, assigned the dates for those webinars, so you'll have to keep your eyes posted for those announcements. Next slide. So I'd, I'd like to turn this over to Devlin Hansen. Devlin is a senior research associate here at Urban and has led our examination of the ETV program. And I want to acknowledge also Kate Thomas, who's with us, who has been a major contributor to the work uh, that you'll hear about today. And so Devlin, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Devlin Hansen, and I'm a senior research associate at the Urban Institute. And I will be presenting our work on evaluating the Chafee Educational and Training Voucher Program. Post-secondary education is an essential pathway for economic and social mobility. Students without financial supports often face challenges in applying to and completing a college education. Youth who are currently or were formerly in foster care are often faced with barriers to college access because they cannot count on the financial supports that parents often continue to provide their children well into their early adult years. This can lead to poor outcomes than their peers, such as being less likely to enroll in college and less likely to earn a degree. Federal and state governments and universities are seeking to alleviate some of these barriers for youth aging out of foster care by providing support through several programs, including tuition waivers and college support programs. The landscape of college resources and support varies widely across the country. The two biggest resources for youth who are currently or were formerly in foster care are extended foster care and tuition waivers. Extended foster care allows youth to stay in foster care after age 18 to receive housing and other services. More than half of states have state or federally funded extended foster care, but some states still do not. Tuition waivers waive in-state tuition for either public two-year schools or public two- and four-year schools for youth who were in foster care. As of 2017, about 20 states had some form of tuition waiver. In addition, there are other state policies and programs which provide other forms of financial aid and scholarships. 
Today, we will discuss a federal program available in all states called the Chasey Educational and Training Voucher Program, also known as the ETV program. The Chasey Educational and Training Voucher Program was created by Congress in 2001. Since 2002, Congress has allocated $43 million annually to states and tribes for this program. The ETV program provides up to $5,000 per year for post-secondary education or training to cover costs of attendance, such as tuition, books, fees, housing, and more based on the unmet need of the youth and the cost of attendance for the youth who are currently in or were formerly in foster care. Until February 2018, youth were eligible to receive an ETV until their 23rd birthday, if enrolled by age 21, and making satisfactory progress. Recent changes in the ETV program with the Family First Prevention Services Act of 2018 include allowing states to extend eligibility up to age 26, but for no more than five years total. This study is the first multi-state analysis of the ETV program, which will look at who receives ETVs, how ETVs are used, and whether ETVs improve recipients' educational outcomes. Today, we will discuss the preliminary answers to our key research questions. We will explore the differences in ETV implementation across states, how you youth use ETVs, the effect of ETV eligibility on college enrollment, the types of institutions youth attend, as well as the characteristics of students who receive an ETV and how their persistence and graduation outcomes differ from their peers. It's important to note that this analysis is still preliminary and we still have additional analysis we will be conducting. We used several different data sources for our research. First, we conducted interviews with state ETV coordinators and administrators in order to learn how states implemented their ETV programs, many of whom are attending the webinar today. Thank you for joining. For each state, we also received state child welfare data matched with ETV program data. Finally, we matched the child welfare data with National Student Clearinghouse data on college enrollment and graduation. It's important to note that there are limitations to the National Student Clearinghouse data, specifically that it misses some technical colleges, training programs, and other for-profit colleges. We selected 10 states to participate in our study in order to achieve geographic diversity, diversity in extended care and tuition waiver availability, and diversity in how they implement their ETV programs. We reached out to other states as well, but they were unable to meet our data sharing needs. While we will discuss implementation across all 10 states, we will only present data from nine of the 10 states. We are still working through some data issues with Colorado, so they have been excluded for the time being. For each of the nine remaining states, we received child welfare histories for all youth who were in care at age 16 or older, from around 2005 to 2017, although the exact years vary from state to state. This sample should include all youth who could potentially be eligible for the program. Overall, this represents 193,000 youth. This data predates the change in the ETV program related to the Family First Prevention Services Act of 2018. So youth in this data set are only eligible for the ETV program until age 23. For our presentation today, we used three primary types of analysis. First, we estimate the effect of being eligible for an ETV on college enrollment using regression analysis to control for things that could affect the outcome. In order to identify this effect, we take advantage of cross-state differences in eligibility. This allows us to answer the question, do ETVs increase the probability that youth will attend college? Second, we use demographics and child welfare histories to predict ETV award among students eligible for ETVs. This helps us to identify which characteristics are associated with ETV use among college students. Finally, we run descriptive tabulations of students who enroll with an ETV compared to ETV eligible students who enroll without an ETV in order to see whether ETV award is associated with educational persistence. It's important to note that these are just associations and that we cannot say whether an ETV is leading to persistence or whether youth who are more likely to persist are more likely to get an ETV. One thing we discovered during our interviews with states is that the implementation of the ETV program varies widely from state to state. 
The ATV program is a state administered program within federal requirements. As such, states can make their own determination on how to best administer the program. There are many aspects of implementation that vary across states. First, the eligibility criteria. In general, any youth who is in care or adopted after the age of 16 could potentially be eligible, but some states are more restrictive. In all of our 10 states, youth who are still in care at age 18 and those who are adopted after age 16 are eligible. In four states, youth who have reunified with their families after age 16 are also eligible for ETVs. Two states have additional criteria based on the amount of time they spend in, spent in care. And one of the states also has a prioritization list in addition to their eligibility criteria. Next, strategies for outreach also vary widely across states. Many states rely heavily on the independent living coordinators to discuss the ETV program with eligible youth aging out of foster care. Some states also use either youth or caseworker conferences and some reach out to youth directly through mail or email. There's also wide variation in the application and dispersal process. In general, youth must apply to the program after enrolling in school, usually in the spring or summer before fall enrollment. Although this is not universally true across ETV programs. One state, which is not included in this analysis, required no application at all, but is able to do a data match with the higher education organization in their state to provide ETV funding as a part of their financial aid package with no application needed. All of the 10 states in our study did require some form of initial application. The application can be anywhere from one to five pages long. Some states provide both paper and online options. Some only provide online and some only provide paper options. Five of the states required students to provide additional documents as a part of the application, such as high school transcript, a copy of the FAFSA, or proof of enrollment. While most states disperse the funds through the colleges, some states give funding to youth directly. Finally, the renewal process for the ETV program also varies across states. All states require that youth maintain satisfactory academic progress, which is defined by the school that they are attending. Although many also allow for an appeals process to continue without maintaining satisfactory academic progress. Some states require youth to recomplete the application entirely every year, and others require, others require no action on the part of the youth at all in order to renew. As described in these last few slides, there is really a wide variation in what states require youth to do in order to receive and maintain an ETB. Next, I'm going to discuss the extent to which eligible youth use ETVs. Across the nine states, 32% of youth who are eligible for ETVs enroll in college by age 21. Of those who enroll by age 21, only 37% were awarded a voucher. There may be many reasons why a youth enrolled in college without a voucher. They may not know about the program, they may not need the voucher due to other funding sources, or there may not be enough funding, although we only heard this in one of our states. We ran regressions to predict which factors influenced whether a youth enrolled with an ETV or not. This chart presents the rate of ETV award among college enrollees who are eligible for an ETV. So for instance, this chart is saying for state one, 31% of youth who were eligible for an ETV and enrolled in college were actually awarded an ETV. The probability of receiving an ETV among those enrolled varied widely by state, even controlling for youth characteristics from 19% of enrolled youth to 62% of enrolled youth. These rates may vary for a number of reasons. For instance, variation in state policies, variation in how the ETV program is implemented and whether there's enough funds available in each state. The reasons behind these differences is something we hope to parse out in future analysis. Most youth, um, so 58% of youth who receive a voucher receive it for more than one year, but a large proportion, 42%, only receive it for one year. One fifth receives the voucher for four or more years. From the program data, it appears that many youth do not use their full awarded amount. One possible reason why youth might be only spending part of the award is that students do not complete 
the year or do not end up attending school at all. Next, we're going to talk about college enrollment and how ETV affects the college enrollment decision. Using variation and eligibility criteria across states, we are able to identify the effect of being eligible for an ETV on enrollment in college. We find that this program leads to more youth attending college. Being eligible for an ETV increases the probability of enrolling by four percentage points or about 15%. This means that the availability of this program increases the probability of a youth attending college by four percentage points. This is a large effect for what is a relatively small amount of funding compared to the cost of attending college. Next, we present descriptive statistics on how enrollment varies for those who receive an ETV and those who do not. Unlike the previous slide, we did not control for youth characteristics and these do not reflect the effect of the program, but rather just associations. Youth receiving education and training vouchers enroll in college at slightly earlier ages with 71% of those enrolled with a voucher enrolling at age 18 or younger, compared to 65% of youth who do not enroll with an ETV. It isn't clear if the ETV leads to earlier enrollment or if those who wait to go to college are less likely to access ETVs, perhaps because they are out of care. Youth receiving education and training vouchers are more likely to attend four-year schools at 34% compared to those who did not receive ETVs at 18%. Youth who enroll with ETVs are also more likely to enroll full-time at 32% compared to only 23% of those who enroll without an ETV. This could be because they have more resources to pay for full-time enrollment than a four-year school. The next several slides look across those who enroll with an ETV and those who enroll without an ETV to see how their characteristics differ. In other words, how do those who enroll with an education and training voucher compare to those who enroll without a voucher? Using regressions, we found that young women are more likely to enroll with an education and training voucher with 40% of females enrolling in school with the vouchers compared to only 32% of males. We found that ETV take up was fairly similar for black, Latino, and white students at around 36%. Asian students were the most likely to enroll with an ETV at 46%, and Native American students were the least likely to enroll with an ETV at 31%. Youth with longer foster care involvement were also more likely to enroll with an ETV, with 40% of those with more than four years in care enrolling with an ETV compared to 28% of those with less than one year in care. Students who spent any time in kinship care were slightly more likely to enroll with an ETV at 38%, compared to 35% for those who were never placed in kinship care. Those who spent any time in group homes or institutions were slightly less likely to enroll with an ETV at 35%, compared to those who were never placed in a group home or institution at 38%. Youth who stay in care at age 18 or older are more likely to enroll with an ETV of 41%. These rates for other types of exits are significantly lower at 18 to 23%, depending on the discharge reason. This may be because youth in care at 18 have more contact with independent living caseworkers and have more contact with the child welfare system in general at the time when they may be enrolling in college. So they may be more likely to learn about the program. Now that we've looked at how the characteristics of youth who receive education and training vouchers compare to those who do not, we will turn to looking at how persistence and graduation rates differ for those who attend college with an ETV versus those who do not. These statistics are preliminary and purely descriptive, and they should not be interpreted as an ETV leading to an outcome, but rather as an association. Youth enrolled with an ETV were more likely to persist. They were more likely to enroll in a second semester and were more likely to enroll in a second year than those who did not enroll with an ETV. 87% of youth who enrolled with an ETV enrolled for a second semester before age 24, compared to only 63% of youth who enrolled without an ETV. Similarly, 59% of youth who enrolled with an ETV enrolled in a second year before age 24, compared to just 30% of youth who enrolled without an ETV. We cannot say whether this is because the ETV program helped them persist 
or because those who are more likely to persist are more likely to receive an ETB. Although we hope to distinguish between these two um, possibilities with some additional analysis. Those enrolled with an ETB were also more likely to take a break of at least a year in their schooling and attended more schools, averaging about two schools attended by age 24 versus one and a half schools for those enrolled without an ETB. Those who enroll with an education and training voucher are much more likely to graduate and more likely to graduate from a four-year college by age 24. Again, since these are purely descriptive, it's unclear whether this is because receiving an ETV helps them graduate earlier or whether those who are more likely to graduate are more likely to receive an ETV. One thing to notice is that the graduation rate for these youth is still really low. Among those who enrolled, only 11% graduated within six years, 16% for those enrolled with an ETV, and 8% for those who enrolled without an ETV. This is much lower than the national average of 35% for a two-year school and 65% for a four-year school. Even though we are seeing that those who enroll with an ETV have higher graduation rates, there is still a significant gap between the graduation rate of youth who are currently or were formerly in foster care and other youth. In sum, we have found that there is wide variation in the implementation of the ETV program across states, and that being eligible for an ETV appears to increase the probability of enrolling in school. We have also found that youth who are female and youth with longer foster care involvement are more likely to enroll with ETVs than other students. Finally, ETV receipt is associated with earlier college enrollment and graduation. The results we presented today are preliminary. We still have some additional analysis to incorporate, including adding variation in state level policies and practices into our analysis, including adding extended care, tuition waivers, and measures of how states implement their ETV program. We will also be running regressions to try to determine the effect of ETV award on persistence. Finally, we will be conducting interviews with youth to incorporate youth perspectives into our work. And now I'd like to welcome Mike Pergament and Kate Thomas, the other members of our evaluation team to join me for our discussion. Right, well, thanks, Devlin. We, uh, that was uh, a quick presentation and we have a lot of extra time for questions and we have a few already. So uh, I'm not the one who's gonna answer them. I'm gonna relay them to you and Kate. Uh, so uh, one, we were asked, are you allowed to use an ETV for trade schools or an apprenticeship program? And uh, to what extent has, has that been incorporated in your research or what are the issues there? Um, so I believe, yes, you are allowed to use the ETV program for those, um, ETV funding for those um, types of programs. Um, that's just something we're not able to obtain through our analysis, um, the National Student Clearinghouse I believe does not have um, that kind of data. Um, so we're not able to see that. However, we are able to see to what extent, um, at least in a few of the states that have provided ETV program data on exactly where youth is going to school, we're able to see what share of youth actually enroll in those types of colleges. Um, although it seems like the rate is, is fairly low. Yeah, I would add that uh, although it is true you can't measure trade schools specifically, uh, a lot of trade related activity takes place in community colleges. And so that would be picked up by National Student Clearinghouse. So then there's a, a question on, uh, you had a result that ETV recipients attend more schools than those who don't get ETVs, would that be partly because of they're more likely maybe to go from community colleges to four-year colleges. So you pick up extra more schools that way. Um, it could be a number of reasons. We're really not sure at this point. Um, it could be um, what, that they're going from two-year schools to four-year schools. Um, it could be that they're just switching schools over time. Um, it's something that we plan to dig into, but I, I don't have a good answer for why we're seeing that Yeah. Okay. Um, 
are you and you looked at uh, graduation through age 24, uh, but a lot of times common measures are through age 26. Are you able to look at that? We are able to look at that for some of the states. Um, for some of the states, the cutoff, um, the time period for which we received data means that um, we can only observe youth through age 24. Um, so we use age 24 to be able to include all of our states in our analysis, um, but we can look through age 26 for a subgroup of our states. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, that sometimes the funding goes directly to the college, sometimes directly to the student. Uh, when it is provided to the student, how do they get that funding? Is it like a check, a direct deposit, or, or what? And then uh, do we know anything about the difference between how funds are used, whether it goes directly to the college versus to the youth? Um, so for um, funds that are directly provided for to the youth, um, it's directly provided through, I think, either a check or direct deposit, although I'd have to double check with the states um, that provide that. Um, for the ones who are going through colleges, um, where the funding goes through colleges, the college is going to apply that funding, you know, first to um, things like tuition, um, but then will, once those um, costs are paid off for the remaining costs associated with cost of attendance. So for instance, um, if the youth is not in, um, getting room and board through the college, then they would receive a check from the college in order to kind of pay for their room and board. I'll just add that when um, ETV programs are distributing it directly to states, I think we've heard that it's through sometimes gift cards, sometimes direct deposit, sometimes mailing a check to the student, um, whereas other times it's on a reimbursement basis, just really depending on the policies of the state. This is one aspect in which really most states have different approaches. And just a quick question, there's the, doesn't an ETV have to be used for accredited schools only? I've, I believe um, that is true. Um, this is something that definitely um, our federal partners, the Children's Bureau could provide more insight on, but um, my understanding is that it's accredited institutions or vocational or technical institutions, but a good question. So do any states have, uh, you, you mentioned that to continue, you have to have satisfactory progress but do any states have minimum academic requirements for their initial eligibility? And that, uh, does that, did you look at whether that affects enrollment or persistence? Not that I know of. I don't recall any state saying that they required a certain um, academic um, level at, by the time that they, um, receive the ETVs, the only requirement is that they're enrolled in school. Um, so they have to meet whatever requirement it would take to enroll in school. Um, so we haven't heard that from any of the states. Um, so in terms of how much of they're getting for the ETV, uh, do you have any information on what percent of their need the ETV is meeting? Obviously. Uh, we know it comes frequently after they get a Pell Grant and would not do. Do you have any sense of what percent of their, uh, say, cost of attendance is covered on average by ETVs? I don't think we have this for most of the states. In fact, I don't think we have cost of attendance for any of the states. Kate, is that right? Um, so we're not able to um, figure that out for sure. We are, since we do have what school that they're attending, we can try and get cost of attendance for that school, um, but we haven't been able to incorporate that data yet. Okay. Um, do you know, what is the median amount of ETV that's being given out, say, per state? 
In general, states award the maximum 5,000 or the maximum that a student needs um, in terms of their unmet need. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the median amount. I know the mean was about $3,400. Is that right, Kate? Okay. Um, so in terms of other, as you continue your, your analyses, do you have other information about the other financial aid that students are receiving, Pell Grants, tuition, uh, as well as when, if they get a tuition waiver? I know you're gonna do some work on the effect of tuition waivers. No, unfortunately we can't tell that in our data. Um, we can tell whether, for instance, tuition waivers were in effect at the time that they enrolled or whether um, extended foster care was in effect at the time that they enrolled, but we don't actually receive any data on what financial assistance that they received. Um, so we're not able to parse that out, for instance, whether they received a Pell Grant. Well, while we're on the subject of the amount of ETVs, uh, did you look at whether how much they receive affects, makes a difference in whether they uh, complete or persist or re-enroll? Um, no, we haven't looked at that yet, but we do plan on looking at that in the future. Yeah, maybe you could kind of say again some of the future things you're going to be looking at. Yes, we have a very long list of future things that we plan to look at, um, one of which is um, incorporating, you know, the state level policies that we um, know would affect youth um, take up of ETVs, such as tuition waivers and extended foster care, as well as how um, states implement the program. We're also planning to pull in iPads data, which provides data on the characteristics of the universities and colleges in our data set um, to look at um, the type more in detail at the types of colleges that they're attending. Um, we are also planning to look um, at really dig into the effects of um, ETV on persistence um, and we'll be digging into um, how um, kind of their use of ETVs affects their persistence. So uh, I think you talked about this a little bit. How are eligible students notified about the program? Can you elaborate a little on that? And also, do you have a sense that anybody, whether it's an IL coordinator or someone, is actually sort of, and I don't know, I'll use this, uh, they asked about tracking and notifying students. So being, anticipating who's gonna be eligible and reaching out to them. Yeah, I mean, our sense is that in general, um, youth learn about the program through their independent living coordinators. Um, and then there's variation across states in how training for the independent living coordinators um, works and how independent living coordinators learn about this. Um, and there's also a lot of variation in terms of how students hear about this. Um, some of the states um, actually email youth um, or mail youth um, flyers about the program if they're eligible. Um, one of the things that child welfare agencies can't really identify with their data sets is, um, you know, whether youth have um, received an ETV or, grad or received a GED or graduated from high school, um, which is a kind of requirement in order to um, enroll in college and receive the ETV. Um, and so it's hard for them to know exactly which students, which um, youth would actually be eligible. Um, so maybe you can go back and talk about not just you know, which factors really accounted for the most variance in terms of whether a youth received an ETV. So I would say that the biggest factor is whether they were in care at age 18 or not. Um, we see huge differences at, um, in terms of um, ETV take up for those who were in care at their 18th birthday versus those who discharged earlier for um, other reasons. Um, the other thing that's, that accounts for, I think, a large amount of the variance is which state that they're in. There's huge variation across states in terms of the share 
of youth who are enrolled who receive an ETV. Um, I think those are the two biggest things that kind of predict whether um, a youth is going to enroll with an ETV. So someone did write in and say that schools must be accredited to receive federal aid and thus ETVs. Youth must maintain the federal 2.0 GPA to make their satisfactory academic progress in order to be eligible for federal aid and ETV. Um, so here's sort of a, a bit of a technical question. I uh, don't want to get too bogged down in technical aspects, but your regressions focus on uh, students' eligibility for an ETV as opposed to whether they actually just get an ETV and how that affects uh, your estimates, how uh, the outcomes you're measuring. And can you talk a little about uh, that compared to the fact that you know, it's a student it just isn't even aware, so they may be eligible, but they're not aware, and so you're not really picking, you're, you don't count, account for that exactly. Yeah, so um, our regression analysis is really taking advantage of the fact that eligibility varies across states. Um, so as I mentioned, um, in four of the states, um, reunification cases are eligible. So cases where the youth exited care due to reunification. Um, and so basically what the regressions do is it, it takes advantage of that and looks at youth who um, re reunified um, and compares the enrollment of youth who reunified in states where reunification cases are eligible compared to um, youth in who reunified in states where um, reunification cases are not eligible. And then it also kind of subtracts out the difference that we see for other types of youth where the eligibility is the same across the state to try and account for state differences. Um, so that's kind of the identification strategy for that um, regression. We also actually looked at, um, we compared states that had um, length of time and care requirements to those who did not um, and use that eligibility criteria to identify um, effects as well. And we saw a similar effect size. Um, so that's really how our, what our identification strategy is. Um, we do not account in there. We cannot tell whether youth knew about ETVs or not. Um, so it's possible that this is kind of, if you actually um, made sure that all youth knew about ETVs, the effect could be even larger. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions about youth outreach. Uh, and before I say that, I also see questions about sort of who they can contact about this work and uh, help with understanding how to get data sharing. So I'm just gonna say, we'll, we'll answer those kinds of questions after the webinar, we'll, we'll pull those out of the, the Q&A and, and try to get answers for those sorts of things. And I'll uh, add also that I put Devlin and Mai's emails in the Q&A chat box, so you can feel free to um, contact us. Excellent, thanks, Kate. Um, you mentioned that some states require documentation. Do you, what sort of documentations are students required to provide when applying for an ETV? It really depends on the state. Um, so some states require a copy of the FAFSA. Um, some states require a copy of a high school transcript or um, GED. Um, and some states require um, a proof of enrollment. So those are the types of things that we've seen across the states that are included our, in our analysis. Um, one thing to note is, you know, we only include 10 of the states um, across the country in this analysis and in our description of how ETV is implemented. And that, you know, for the other 40 states, we might see even, even more variation. I discussed one other state that we spoke to who um, is not a part of this evaluation, but for instance, they do not require an application at all or any kind of, um, of documentation because they're able to provide the ETV through um, data matches. So they're able to figure out once somebody enrolls in school, they do a data match with the child welfare agency to determine whether they're eligible. 
and just kind of automatically um, include the ETV as a part of their um, financial aid package. Um, so there's huge variation and we only see a, a small portion of that variation um, in our analysis since we only really talk to um, 10 states. Uh, were any of the states that you talked to using a, a third party to administer the ETVs versus doing it in-house? And is there any, uh, anything uh, you can say about that? Yes. So um, I can't remember whether it's three or four of our states um, have the ETV program administered through Foster Care to Success. Um, so they kind of take care of the application process, um, and they also actually are, you know, those are the only situations in which students are really provided with any sort of services outside of what um, other, you know, non-ETV youth um, would receive as a part of being a former foster youth or still being in extended foster care. So they do provide uh, um, some additional services to youth. Um, such as care packages and kind of just assistance generally. Um, but that that is the only um, service provider we have in our state. Um, there are <clears throat> other service providers that we've heard about from other states that are not included our, in our analysis. Um, at this point, we haven't done an analysis by whether they have a service provider or not, um, but that's something that we can do in the future. Uh, so there was a follow-up on the documentation question. Someone asking, uh, do, do they have to show any documentation about their time spent in foster care, uh, particularly say these youth who were reunified or have already aged out of care? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember anybody having to do that. Um, my understanding is that for the most part, the child welfare agency is able to um, look up in their data sets whether this person was in care or not. Um, Kate, I don't know if you had anything. Yeah, to add. I know that I know that that can be complicated when the youth might be applying for an ETV in a different state from which they were previously in foster care. Um, so in those situations, the youth might sometimes have to provide their own child welfare history as part of the application. Um, but I do think for the most part, that is um, something that happens more so behind the scenes. Um, so keeping on the outreach theme, as I said, we had a lot of questions there. I'm trying to get them organized here. Uh, but uh, so to what extent do states reach out to youth directly? Sort of uh, when you think about the collection of NIDID, the National Youth in Transition Database. So the, the states literally are reaching out to you to conduct a survey of how they're doing. Is there anything like that that states do, particularly for youth who have left care? Not really. I mean, um, we heard of, about um, one of the states providing uh, mailers to all youth who were eligible um, or who could potentially be eligible. Um, but for the most part, they really rely on the caseworkers to discuss this with them. The other thing that um, a lot of times flags um, the ETV program for youth is there's a question as a part of the FAFSA form, which asks whether you were ever in foster care um, and then provides the contact information for the ETV coordinator. Um, so I know that a lot of the states have gotten work we're receiving a lot of calls um, related to that question because that's how some youth found out about this program. Um, however, I think what we heard is that a lot of those calls <clears throat> that they received were from um, youth who uh, were formerly in foster care, but um, were not eligible. So they were in foster care when they were two to four and so they weren't in care in this kind of after age 16 and therefore weren't really eligible. Um, but we did hear about that as another way that youth have heard about the program. So back on the questions someone asked about providing documentation regarding being in length of being in foster care, or having how long you're in care, a couple of people chimed in with some answers. Uh, one 
which says sometimes a young person will have to provide the last court letter when they emancipated. Uh, and another who says that in California, a letter of dependency is provided for foster youth to show proof of current or previous dependency in foster care. So thank you to the audience for helping with some of this. Uh, what, uh, you look through, again, back on the point, you looked at graduation through 24, and in, of course, under the Family First Act, ETVs are now eligible for up to age 26. Is that anything you will be able to look at? So unfortunately, our data stops in 2017, so we will not be able to look at college outcomes for those who would be eligible um, up to age 26. So it's not really something we can look at. We can look at, at least for some of the states, the extent to which youth are enrolling in school up to age 26. Um, and so that can give us a sense of maybe how many youth could potentially utilize the ETV or how many additional youth might be able to utilize the ETV up to age 26. But I think this discussion around outreach has um, really pinpointed the fact that if the, um, the longer that a youth has been out of care, the longer, um, the less likely they are to know about the ETV program as a resource. Um, so to the, um, we won't be able to say to what extent um, the youth kind of between age 23 and 26 would actually take up. In addition, um, not all of the states have decided to extend ETV eligibility to age 26. So I believe five out of the 10 states that are included in our analysis have decided to extend to age 26, um, but five have not and have decided to kind of keep things at age 23. Yeah, I'll just add, um, I think at this point, it's actually six and um, some of them are still in the process of implementing that transition. Um, but we will possibly be able to qualitatively understand the effect of this in our um, work with youth, our focus groups with youth um, from these states. So in talking to the states, did you come across any who have actually are either doing an evaluation uh, of their ETV program or any kind of uh, research, maybe not a formal evaluation, but looking into how it's working? So all the states have been very interested in this, um, but I don't know of any of the states who are doing uh, formal evaluations. Kate, do you remember any mention no. of? Anything like I that. know there's ongoing work um, from external evaluators with California's ETV program, um, but I don't know of any states doing internal evaluations, although it would be great to be corrected in the chat if we're wrong, but um, not that we've heard about in our interviews. I know we've been able to, um, for at least one or two of the states, they've they've received the National Student Clearinghouse data themselves um, and then provided it to us. Um, so they do have access to that data as a part of this evaluation. So we're, uh, questions have slowed down here. Uh, and so I think this will be the final question. We're gonna end early. Uh, basically, can you say something about uh, how you'll be disseminating your results going forward. Yeah, so we have um, a lot of plans for dissemination. Um, we will be um, producing a full report of the ETV um, evaluation probably this summer, <laughs> um, hopefully. <laughs> Um, which will um, provide the results of our evaluation um, quantitatively. Um, as, as we mentioned, we're also doing focus groups with youth um, to get their perspectives and incorporate those into our analysis. Um, so we'll also be reporting on that um, through publicly available reports. Okay, well, as I said, I think we're going to end a little early and uh, I just wanna thank Devlin for a very informative seminar, webinar. And Kate, thanks for joining in. Great work on both your part. I want to thank the audience for joining. We hope you found this of interest. And just a reminder, the, the recording and the slides will be posted on the Urban Institute website. website. That's just urban.org. 
And uh, don't forget to keep your eye out for our future webinars that will happen sometime early next year on youth employment programs. And so I just wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, and we hope to see you at our next webinar after the new year. Thank you.